Hello, my name is Alex Siles and welcome to the Great Hall of Newcastle's Castle. Now, the first thing to start off with on this video is that the name, the Great Hall, is actually a Victorian name. During the Middle Ages, this would not have been referred to as the Great Hall. Instead, that would have been another building outside of the castle keep. So just outside of the castle and down today where we have the courts and the Vermont Hotel, next to there, there would have been the Great Hall, which was a two-story building. The top level would have had um, a hall inside and that would have been for feasting and eating and drinking, a very sociable space. And underneath that, on the ground level, there would be kitchens, there would be wine cellars, food stores, and it was very much a place to have food and drink and um, almost like your social uh, activities involved down there. Up here, on the other hand, in the hall of the castle, this would have been a space for the king, the monarch. Uh, you may have still had eating and drinking in here, but not in the same way as you'd have had in the Great Hall, which would have been very much your social uh, side. So that would be where you would want to make friends with the lords and the barons and bring them together and have a social space there. But up here in the Great Hall, this is where the king holds court. This is where royal power is given. This is where people are knighted. This is where oaths of fealty are taken and land is distributed and given out. So it's a very much an official place, kind of like a courtroom today or like um, whenever, wherever the king is, that's also where you can hold parliament. That's also where you can have um, court cases that are very high end. You know, those sort of really important decisions happen wherever the king is. And this room here actually has a lot of influence with this Anglo-Scottish wars and it's very important in, in both English and Scottish history. But just before we do that, I'll show you some features of the room that I like talking about. So to start off with, we have some wonderful banners right here on the wall. So we have the Royal Banner of England. Then we also have the Ogle family right here, the D'Omfreville Banner. We have the Nevilles, who were an incredibly powerful family in County Durham, and one of the Nevilles was actually given the moniker uh, the Kingmaker because he was able to decide who would become monarch. And then over here, we have the Lords of Northumberland, the Percy family, and both the Nevilles and the Percy, sometimes they were friends, sometimes they were enemies, sometimes they would marry each other. So the best way to describe them would be the modern term frenemy, uh, sometimes close allies, sometimes enemies, because they were looking to become the most powerful families in the north of England. The actual structure of this hall would have been quite different in the past. So up around the banners, you can see holes in the, uh, the walls. Those smaller holes are actually where in the past there would have been the medieval roof for this hall. So that would have gone up there and everything above that would have actually been outside. So that's the medieval roof and anything above that is open to the elements. The holes you can see that are massive down here, just below the banners, those ones are just following around the, uh, the room here, they're actually from the English Civil War, or as it should be known, the War of Three Kingdoms between England, Scotland, and Ireland. There would have been massive oak beams put across there, and they would have actually rested cannons on that level. And when they rested cannons on that level, that was because at the time, uh, parliamentarian forces had actually taken Gateshead. And so the castle was being used as a firing platform for the royalist cannons to fire out at Gateshead at the south bank of the River Tyne, opposite Newcastle. And so that's there for the, par the royalist guns to fire out on the parliamentarians. And in the same way, the parliamentarians were firing back at the royalists at Newcastle as well. So there was a bit of a conflict going on there as well in the history too. I mentioned before that this hall has seen important events that, that basically had an effect on both English and Scottish history. And it's because in the hall here, this is the location where Edward I, Edward Longshanks, also known as the Hammer of the Scots, took the oath of fealty from John Balliol, who became King of Scots. Now this had all been caused in motion because the last King of Scots had died. And when he died, his closest relation was Margaret, maid of Norway, who was the daughter of the King of Norway, and her mother had been a Scottish princess. So because of that, she comes across from Norway to England, and she's going to marry Edward II, which would therefore bring together the English and Scottish dynasties, and uh, maybe would have resulted in a united kingdom back then. 
reality is he probably would have had two sons and one would have become king of Scotland, one would become king of England, and there would have still been a lot of warfare going on in the kingdoms anyway. But it's nice to sort of tie up history romantically and go, oh yes, England and Scotland would have been one nation together even back then. When in matter of fact, obviously, we've had long conflicts that have resulted to us becoming uh, the United Kingdom you see us today. And uh, even with all of the politics going on in the world, I think you can say that most English people in Scottish people get on really well and just see ourselves as a part of the, the mixture of peoples in the British Isles. But what happens is that Margaret, on her way over from Norway, passes away. And so she can't marry Edward II. When she can't marry Edward II, the Scottish nobles start coming together and trying to figure out who has the greatest claim, and eventually boils down to two families, the Barliol family and the Bruce family. So you've got John Barliol and you have Robert the Bruce. What happens is that those two men are then invited by Edward I, who has a very deep interest on in who's going to become the next King of Scotland, and they start talking out, and what happens is that John Barliol probably makes some nice deals with Edward in the background, and Edward decides that actually Barliol should be King of Scots. And so he's made King of Scotland, Edward comes up here to Newcastle, Barliol comes down, they have a feast, and Barliol pays homage and swears fealty to him as King of Scotland for his English territories. And there's a lot of things going on there, but uh, this would have been quite common in the Middle Ages because um, Edward I also had to swear allegiance to the King of France for his French territories. And so because of that, there was always this thing going on where would the King of France have seen Edward, uh, Edward as, you know, the, as, as his sub-king? Would he have considered English, England as a part of his territory? Probably not. But the way that Edward I interpreted this swearing of fealty was that John Balliol was his, um, was his uh, vassal. He was his sub-lord. And he was the high king of all of Britain, you know, England, Scotland, and Wales all together. And he was the over king, whereas John Barliol was under him as a sub king. John Barliol, probably on the other hand, probably heard it slightly differently and saw it as like, oh, I'm swearing fealty for my territories in England. This then resulted in a long war. John Barliol was seen as a bit of a puppet king, and he's actually referred to as the hollow cloak, which is in, in Scots, which uh, is not a very nice thing to say to someone. It's just like, look, you're just wearing the mantle of a king. You're just a puppet. And so Barliol lost uh, his throne, and it started the uh, Anglo-Scottish Wars. Bruce fought, and eventually Bruce becomes king of Scots. And so inside this room here, that's where one of the events that caused the Anglo-Scottish Wars and so many